Dear students, today's topic is production of low temperatures intended for BSc second year students of third semester. In this lecture, we will be studying about the various methods of producing very low temperatures and some of its applications. The behavior of matter at low temperatures is very peculiar when compared to that at no normal temperatures. With the discovery of superconductivity at very low temperatures, scientists all over the world became curious to produce low temperatures and to investigate the phenomena occurring at these temperatures. It has become a task for the scientists to produce as low temperature as possible. And recently, scientists at an Italian institute have set a world record of lowest temperature ever achieved in the universe. They cooled a copper vessel of volume 1 cubic meter to minus 273.144 degrees Celsius, which is very, very close to the absolute zero, which is minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. The contents of this presentation will be as follows. After a brief introduction, we will be discussing about the methods of producing low temperatures. Then adiabatic demagnetization method will be discussed in a greater detail. Later, regenerative cooling of liquefaction of air. Then, helium liquefaction by Kapitza method, refrigeration and finally, applications of low temperatures. As early as 18th century, sulfur dioxide was liquefied using common salt and ice. At the same time, Dutch scientists liquefied ammonia gas by applying pressure. Carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide were liquefied by reducing pressure. Now the question is, can we liquefy a gas just by applying pressure irrespective of temperature? After a lot of experiments, scientists discovered that for every gas there exists a certain minimum temperature called critical temperature below which gases can be liquefied by the application of pressure alone. So pre-cooling, pre-cooling is cooling the gas below its uh, critical temperature so as to apply pressure to apply to liquefy a gas that is cooling below its uh, critical temperature alone will uh, liquefy a gas by applying a pressure. A gas above the critical temperature cannot be liquefied even by applying 3000 atmospheres of pressure. Similarly, they identified that there exists a minimum pressure called critical pressure above which only gases can be liquefied by reducing the temperature. From this, we can understand that the temperature and pressure are interrelated in the liquefaction of gases. Next, we will be discussing about methods of producing low temperatures one by one. The first one is freezing mixture. The second one evaporation of liquids under reduced pressure. Then third, adiabatic expansion of compressed gas and the fourth method is adiabatic desorption. The fifth method, joule thomson expansion and the sixth one is adiabatic demagnetization. Let us see the freezing mixture. This is a simple method. The freezing mixture is the mixture of salt and ice. When salt is mixed with the ice, ice melts in the salt and salt dissolves in the melted ice. For these two processes, heat is required. The heat required for the melting of ice is called latent heat of fusion of ice and the heat required for the dissolving of salt inside the ice is called heat of solution. These two heats are absorbed from the freezing mixture itself, thereby cooling the freezing mixture. The lowest temperature that can be achieved by this method, freezing mixture method is called eutectic temperature. It depends upon the salt. The eutectic temperatures for example, for sodium chloride it is minus 22 degrees Celsius and uh, potassium hydroxide it is minus 65 degrees Celsius. Now the second method is evaporation of liquids under reduced pressure. We know that from clausius clapeyron equation. As pressure decreases, boiling point decreases. That is, the liquid boils at lower temperature than its original boiling point. So, during this boiling, it absorbs latent heat, cools itself and its surroundings. This is the principle involved in the evaporation of liquids under reduced pressure. 
So, when pressure decreases, boiling point decreases and the liquid boils at lower temperatures and in the, ca in the uh, case of boiling, it absorbs some heat called latent heat and this heat is taken from itself and its the surroundings, thereby it cools. And the next one is the fourth third method is adiabatic expansion of a compressed gas. A highly compressed gas suddenly allowed to expand adiabatically, the system has to do work to expand. When a system does work on the surroundings, the system's internal energy decreases. When work is done on the system, system's internal energy increases. So, in general, this is the case. So, when a system does work on the surroundings, system's internal energy decreases and work is done on the system, system's internal energy increases. And in this case, when the gas is expanding, it is doing work on the surroundings. So, its internal energy decreases and hence the gas cools. This is an example from our daily life. This is a perfume bottle. When you spray the perfume bottle, what happens? From the high pressure, it is sprayed out into the atmosphere. So, it uh, when you put a hand on, uh, on this spray, you can observe that a cooling is observed. So, this happens because it is coming from high pressure region to low pressure region. In that way, it cools. Then, the fourth method is adiabatic desorption. To understand what is adiabatic desorption, first let us understand what is adsorption. When a solid is immersed in a liquid or a gas, the molecules of the liquid or a gas, they are adhered to the solid surface. That is, they stick to the solid surface, forming a thin film on the surface. So, this process involves liberation of heat. The opposite of this adsorption is the desorption process. During desorption, the solid from the thin film from the solid surface is removed and the molecules of the liquid or the gas uh, are removed from the solid surface. So, this process involves what is called cooling effect. So, desorption when it is done adiabatically, the heat is taken from the internal energy of the solid and the solid is further cooled. This method is used in Simon's method of liquefying helium. Then the fifth method is joule thomson expansion. This is also called joule Kelvin expansion. In this case, what happens is here uh, a gas from high pressure region. So, this is the high pressure region A and this is a low pressure region B. So, when a gas is forcibly made to enter into this porous plug, porous plug, porous plug is nothing but a substance which has got fine holes in it. For example, cotton, jute, all these are porous materials. So, when air is uh, forcibly pressed from this side into the uh, second region B, which is at low pressure, then the there is a change in temperature of the gas and this is called joule thomson expansion. In general, for all the gases at room temperature, cooling effect is observed, whereas for hydrogen and helium, a heating effect is observed at room temperature and this change in the uh, temperature is directly proportional to the pressure difference between the two regions and also on the nature of the gas. And this method, uh, joule thomson expansion method is already discussed in the earlier classes. We will go to the next uh, method called adiabatic demagnetization. This is a very important method because we can obtain very low temperatures by using this method. It is very simple method. It consists of, uh, this is the principle involved isothermal magnetization followed by adiabatic demagnetization. Magnetization is here a paramagnetic salt is taken and it is magnetized by a powerful magnetic field. During magnetization, the molecules of the uh, paramagnetic salt, they align in the direction of the magnetic field and some work is done again from the system on from the uh, by the surroundings on the system. Here our system is paramagnetic salt and the surroundings is the magnetic field. So, magnetic field is doing work on the system therefore, it, uh, it liberates some heat. 
So, this heat is given out to the surroundings and its uh, temperature is maintained constant. Therefore, this is called isothermal magnetization. After magnetization, now the magnetic field is removed. So, during removal of magnetic field, now the work is done by the system on the surroundings. Therefore, there is a cooling effect. So, again this is an adiabatic process. The the heat that is lost by the uh, paramagnetic salt is not allowed to take from the surroundings. Therefore, it is an adiabatic demagnetization. Therefore, the cooling effect is observed for in the paramagnetic salt. So, it, it also cools its uh, surroundings. Let us see what happens in this uh, adiabatic demagnetization. If a substance is already at low temperature, the fall in temperature is more considerable of the order of 1 Kelvin and it is based on the magnetocaloric effect. Magnetocaloric effect is the effect, the interdependence of magnetic field and the thermal effect. Magnetic and thermal effect together will produce this magnetic magnetocaloric effect and this method adiabatic demagnetization is proved to be environmentally safe because we are not using any chemical here it is a safe process. Now, let us calculate what is the uh, fall in temperature during this uh, adiabatic demagnetization. Let us take a paramagnetic salt of intensity of magnetization I subjected to a magnetic field H. So, intensity of magnetization is the property of the paramagnetic salt I and subjected to the magnetic field it is external magnetic field H. So, during this change in magnetization is D I therefore, work done during magnetization is given by H D I. During demagnetization work done will be equal to minus H D I because during magnetization work done is, is H D I and during demagnetization work done one will be equal to minus of H D I. So, from first law of thermodynamics we have d q is equal to d u plus p d v. So, here p d the uh, p d v is the work done in this case p d v is 0 because there is no considerable change in volume because of small temperatures. So, we will take d w as minus h d i only and then substitute in the first law of thermodynamics we have d q is equal to d u minus h d i. Now, Taking the Maxwell's second relation, we have dou T by dou P of S equal to minus of dou V by dou S of P, replacing P by minus H because we have taken the work done to be minus H D I. So, P D V is replaced by H D minus H D I. So, we are replacing P with minus H and V with I. Then we get minus of dou T by dou H of S is equal to dou I by dou S of H. Now, this minus sign is taken to the other side and then the right hand side is divided the numerator and denominator both are divided with the dou t then we get minus of dou i by dou t by dou s by dou t at constant magnetic field. So, and then we are taking the denominator of this dou s by dou t and you are multiplying this with the t multiplying and dividing with the t then we get t into dou s by dou t divided by t that t dou s is taken as dou q because from second law of thermodynamics we have d q is equal to t d s. So, we are writing this as 1 by t into dou q by dou t. This dou q by dou t is nothing but the specific heat and here since magnetic field is kept constant. So, it is c h the specific heat at constant magnetic field divided by t. So, you are substituting this dou s by dou t as c h by t in this equation. So, we get this equation then by rearranging we get dou t is equal to t by minus t by c h into dou i by dou t of h into dou h. Then we know that the paramagnetic susceptibility is defined as the ratio of intensity of magnetization to the magnetic field. So, from Curie's laws Curie's law we have chi that is susceptibility is given by C c by t where C c is the Curie constant and t is the absolute temperature. So, we equate because we have for pa paramagnetic susceptibility we have chi is equal to i by h and chi is equal to 
c c by t just equate the right hand sides of these two equations we get i by h is equal to c c by t on differentiating both sides with respect to t we have this is 1 by h into dou i by dou t at constant h magnetic field is kept constant that is equal to on the right hand side we have c c since it is a constant we will take it like that only and minus of c c by t square. So, this after rearranging this we are substituting in the earlier equation. So, this is the earlier equation. So, this and from these two equations we get t dou t is equal to c c by c h into h d h. Now, the magnetic field is now reduced to 0. So, on both the sides we are uh, integrating within the limits the temperature is increased from initial temperature T i to the final temperature T f. T d t is equal to minus of c c by c h and integrating between the limits h to 0 h d h because the magnetic field initially is taken as h and then we are making it to 0 during demagnetization. Therefore, we are integrating between the limits h to 0 h d h. So, on integration we get T f square minus T i square by 2 is equal to minus of C c by C h into h square by 2 and 2 is cancelled on both the sides and then this is in the form of a square minus b square therefore, therefore, we are writing this as a minus b into a plus b that is T f minus T i into T f plus T i and that T f plus T i is taken to the other side and then it is multiplied and divided by 2. T f plus T i by 2 is taken as T average. So, we get the final expression for the change in temperature during adiabatic demagnetization as minus of C c by 2 C h into h square by T average. So, the fall in temperature of the paramagnetic salt can be cal calculated by this equation T f minus T i is equal to minus of C c by 2 C h into h square by T average. So, this is the uh, difference of temperature. Now, let us see what is the experiment to of adiabatic demagnetization. So, this is the experimental setup. This ring, the inside ring, it is called, it is the paramagnetic substance and this is suspended using a nylon or a silk thread on to this uh, inside cylinder. So, A is the cylindrical chamber and inside the cylindrical chamber helium gas is filled in the beginning and this cylindrical chamber is surrounded by liquid helium at 1 Kelvin in a Dewar flask B. So, the second flask is uh, the Dewar flask B and this is filled with liquid helium at 1 Kelvin temperature and this is again surrounded by another Dewar flask C and it contains liquid hydrogen and this cylindrical tube is surrounded by these are the susceptibility measuring coils which are used to measure temperature and this whole apparatus is kept in between two strong pole pieces of a strong electromagnet which provides around 10,000 gauss of magnetic field. Next, <coughs> temperature of the, of the flask B is reduced to 1 Kelvin using diffusion pump. So, first the, uh, the flask B temperature is reduced to 1 Kelvin and then chamber A is filled with helium gas. And now, the magnetic field is switched on. So, when magnetic field is switched on, what happens? As I told you, the alignment of the molecules inside the paramagnet takes place and it increases the temperature of the paramagnetic salt. And since the chamber A is filled with helium gas, it immediately the heat of magnetization is removed by conduction by this gaseous helium to the liquid helium which is present in the next chamber B. And the temperature is maintained same. So, the gaseous helium which is present in the chamber A, it absorbs the heat whatever heat it has uh, increased because of the magnetization and that is, that is uh, taken by the next chamber B and in that way we can remove the excess temperature whatever it has uh, gained due to magnetization. So, this is the process called isothermal magnetization. 
Later, the helium gas in A is pumped off. Now, it is vac evacuated because ma after magnetization, we have to do demagnetization and that has to be done adiabatically. So, helium gas in A is pumped off so that the paramagnetic salt becomes thermally insulated from B. Now, the magnetic field is switched off. Now, due to adiabatic demagnetization, the temperature of the paramagnetic substance falls and the fall of temperature can be detected by the susceptibility measuring coils which are uh, surrounded around A. Next, the next process is liquefaction of air. So, by regenerative cooling. Air is liquefied, generally all the gases are liquefied by using Joule-Kelvin effect or Joule-Thomson effect when a compressed gas initially at low temperature is forced to uh, flow through a fine orifice, its temperature falls. So, here it should be noted that Joule-Kelvin effect, uh, it is uh, uh, applicable for the porous plug as well as a single hole also. So, when a compressed gas is allowed to enter through a fine single orifice, its temperature falls. And the fall of temperature is greater if the initial temperature is less. So, in order to make the initial temperature less, the emerging cooled gas from the orifice is made to flow back over the tube containing the initial incoming gas. See, the air, it is made to flow through the orifice and due to Joule-Kelvin effect, a cool air is coming out and this cool air is made to flow again on the incoming gas in the, uh, in the tube, over this tube, then its temperature further decreases and this is continued till we get li finally liquid air. So, this is called regenerative cooling. From the name itself, we can understand that it is cooling again and again, so that we get liquid air finally. Then, liquefaction of helium by Kapitza method. The principle involved is here it is using two, two methods as we have discussed earlier adiabatic expansion and Joule Kelvin effect. And it, it, the special feature of this method, Kapitza method is it uses a special expansion engine in which there is no lubricant needed because this the lubricant at, at uh, such low temperatures, no lubricant will be in the liquid state. So, they, be, they freeze at those temperatures. Therefore, no lubricant is available to be uh, used at those temperatures. So, due to the special type of expansion engine, we can, uh, there is no need of using lubricant in this method. And the piston is loosely fitted with a definite small gap. So, expansion engine, there is a piston and between the expansion and engine and the piston, a lubricant has to be used, but this is a special type of expansion engine wherein we, can, we need not use any lubricant. And there is no need of liquid hydrogen also, because liquid hydrogen is an expensive liquid, we need not use in this method liquid hydrogen is not used and instead liquid nitrogen is used which is uh, relatively cheaper. So, we will see the experimental setup. This is the compressor and in this helium gas is uh, compressed to 30 atmospheres pressure. From there, when once it is compressed, its temperature increases. So, this temperature which has increased is uh, cooled by circulating cold water around this jacket. This is the cold water circulation and from this it enters into a refrigerating coil which is surrounded by liquid nitrogen bath. So, I, as I told you, here instead of using liquid hydrogen, we are using liquid nitrogen, so that the, the gas, the helium gas, when it enters into this refrigerating coil, it is pre-cooled. So, pre-cooling as I explained, in order to apply pressure and liquefy, we have to uh, decrease the temperature of the liquid of the gas below a certain temperature called critical temperature. So, that process is called pre-cooling. So, pre-cooling is done in this chamber. So, from this it enters into this, uh, this is called heat exchanger and heat exchanger at the heat exchanger we have uh, 
a bifurcation here. So, 90 percent of the gas enters into the expansion engine and only 10 percent of the gas goes straight away here. So, here this at this point the expansion engine this is the expansion engine wherein I told you this is the piston this piston is loosely held in this expansion engine. Now, due to this expansion the gas its temperature decreases to minus 263 degrees Celsius and this cooled gas is made to circulate on the incoming gas through a pipe a spiral tube which is not shown in the figure and this cooled gas minus 263 degrees Celsius cooled gas it, it, uh, it goes around the incoming gas tube and cools, the, uh, cools it further and after this finally it goes into this uh, pipe C and reaches the compressor here. So, again the process continues again it goes into this jacket and from there it is cooled by this refrigerating coil inside the liquid nitrogen and from there it enters the expansion engine again it goes to the expansion engine heat exchanger and expansion engine and then it cools again it goes. So, this continues this cycle continues until we get a liquid nitrogen and this is a small orifice nozzle here and this is the expansion expansion at low temperature and so in this case we can see that the liquid nitrogen it uh, the liquid helium is obtained at the uh, bottom of the flask. So, this uh, here at the nozzle end there is uh, Joule Kelvin effect taking place. So, Joule uh, the expansion as well as Joule Kelvin effect both of them will be uh, used in this method. This is called Capizza method and once again we will uh, see this method how it occurs. There is a compressor at and helium gas is taken in the compressor and it is cooled to minus uh, it is first pressure is increased to minus uh, 30 atmospheres pressure from there it enters into another chamber because it is because it is uh, the pressure is increased its uh, temperature increases and during this process the um, this it is passed through uh, a spiral tube which is having water cold water and from there it enters into a liquid nitrogen bath wherein its temperature is further cooled due to pre cooling. From there it enters into the expansion heat, uh, heat exchanger and at the heat exchanger it is bifurcated into two parts one is uh, 90 percent of the gas enters into the decrease to minus 263 degrees Celsius and this is the Capizza method of liquefaction of helium. Helium and hydrogen are the most difficult gases that were to be liquefied. So, this is successfully done by this Capizza method. Then we will go to the next uh, topic refrigeration. What is refrigeration? The process of producing low temperatures maintaining an enclosure at those at that low temperature is called refrigeration. Refrigerator is a machine that causes heat energy to flow from a cold to a hot region. We know that from Carnot's uh, from the second law of thermodynamics by nature heat always flows from a hot body to a cold body, but in the refrigerator a, an opposite process is done. So, by external agency a machine a, that causes heat energy to flow from a cold region to a hot region that is called refrigerator. Carnot engine working in the reverse direction can be considered as an ideal refrigerator. So, this is the schematic diagram of the uh, process that takes place inside a refrigerator. The refrigerator it absorbs heat from a cold reservoir which is at a temperature T2 a, an amount of Q2 heat is taken by the refrigerator and work is done uh, on the refrigerator and greater amount of heat is given out to the hot reservoir which is at the temperature T1. Domestic refrigerators use uh, in this cold reservoir is food and ice. Food and ice act as cold reservoir 
surroundings act as hot reservoirs and work is done by the electric motor. Working substance is in general freon. Then, so in order to understand the efficiency of a fridge refrigerator, we call what is called coefficient of performance. Coefficient of performance is defined as the ratio of amount of heat removed per cycle to the mechanical work to be done. So, this is denoted by beta. Beta is equal to amount of heat removed per cycle, it is uh, from the cold reservoir, it is absorbing an amount of heat Q2, so Q2 by W, but W is given by Q1 minus Q2. Therefore, we have beta is equal to Q2 by Q1 minus Q2. By rearranging, we get beta is equal to 1 by Q1 minus Q1, Q1 by Q2 minus 1, which is equal to 1 by T1 by T2 minus 1. So, beta can be written as T2 by T1 minus T2, but we know that the Carnot engine efficiency is given by eta, eta is equal to 1 minus T2 by T1. So, from these two beta and eta that is a coefficient of performance of a refrigerator and coefficient of uh, heat engine efficiency of heat engine they are related by this relation, beta is equal to 1 minus eta by eta. We know that the coefficient of uh, the efficiency of heat engine it increases when T 2 is less, when T 2 is less and less the eta value increases, whereas the beta is equal to 1 minus eta by eta. Therefore, when eta increases beta value decreases. Therefore, during regular functioning of a refrigerator T 2 goes on decreasing that is the temperature of the cold reservoir goes on decreasing because of the formation of ice inside the deep freezer. So, T 1 is the surrounding temperature which, re which remains the same. So, the coefficient of performance of a refrigerator goes on decreasing as time passes. In order to increase the performance, we have to increase the T 2 value. How to increase the T 2 value? By increasing uh, by regular defrosting of the refrigerator, we can improve the uh, coefficient of performance of a refrigerator. Then refrigerants, refrigerant is a fluid which undergoes phase transitions from liquid to gas and gas to liquid. So, this always continues in a cycle in the inside the refrigerator there is a liquid. For large refrigerating plants uh, ammonia is used as a refrigerant whereas, for domestic refrigerators sulphur dioxide and freon were used uh, earlier nowadays they are using HFCs that is hydrofluorocarbons. So, there we have studied that the chlorofluorocarbons are responsible for the depletion of ozone layer. In order to prevent this uh, ozone layer depletion Montreal protocol is the one which is uh, which is uh, which says that the usage of chlorocarbons is dangerous and instead of that hydrofluorocarbons are used nowadays to save the depletion of the ozone layer. Then what are the features of a good refrigerant uh, we will see low boiling point and freezing point because it has to change its phase inside the fridge and outside the fridge very quickly. So, it should have low boiling point and low freezing point. Then large latent heat of vaporization because it has to absorb a lot of heat from the refrigerator, it should possess latent heat of vaporization a very large value. Then low specific heat, non flammable, non exp explosive, non corrosive, non toxic because it has to be used for food material, for storage of food material it has to have contain all these properties. High thermal conductivity should be there, low specific volume and it should occupy minimum size of the compressor and high coefficient of performance. These are the properties of a good refrigerant. Then uses of low temperatures, superconductivity we know that the conductivity of the conductors increases uh, abnormally at low temperatures that is one use and the second one is below 90 Kelvin all the chemical reactions cease to occur therefore, food can be preserved safely at those temperatures. Then liquid oxygen is used in hospitals for re respiration, liquid oxygen and charcoal is used in explosives, then ammonia and sulphur dioxide uh, freon are used in liquid state in the refrigeration and in ACs. Then 
as we understood that at low temperatures the chemical reactions cease to occur we can study the atomic heat susceptibility thermal and electrical conductivity uh, by at uh, these low temperatures then exploration of upper atmosphere and then superconductivity and superfluidity can be understood at these low temperatures how does a refrigerator work let us see a vapor compression machine which is uh, used in our domestic refrigerators our domestic refrigerator schematic diagram is like this it contains five important components the first one is compressor p as you can see in the figure this is the compressor and the second one is evaporator e and the third one is one is condenser and the fourth one is expansion valve and the fifth one is the refrigerant the liquid that flows inside this tube is the refrigerant so these are the five major components of a fridge and we know that this part this e evaporator is only present inside the fridge and the remaining parts remaining parts uh, three parts are inside that is back side of the fridge so only this part is enclosed inside the refrigerator the refrigerant undergoes a phase change during compression and expansion during compression the it here during compression it converts into liquid the vapor phase liquid uh, refrigerant converts into liquid phase and it enters into this compressor condenser so condenser it cools there is a water circulating and whatever due heat that is uh, it is absorbed due to compression that is released by circulating cold water around this pipe and from there it enters into this expansion valve it is also called throttling valve here there is a small orifice from there this liquid refrigerant enters into this expansion valve so during this process uh, joule thomson effect again takes place so its its uh, temperature is uh, heavily reduced from there it enters into this evaporator this evaporator is present at very low pressure so due, due to this low pressure the liquid it starts boiling here when it boils it takes the latent heat of vaporization from this enclosure that is from the refrigerator so it takes all the heat from the refrigerator in order to change its phase that is from liquid phase it is converting into vapor phase for that it absorbs all the heat and then from here the uh, the vapor form of refrigerant again en enters into the compressor this cycle repeats and whatever heat it is uh, it it has to get due to latent heat of vaporization that will be absorbed from the inside the fridge in this way this continues this cycle continues and the refrigerant refrigerator is cooled again and again so these vd and vs are the valves that are um, that regulate the flow of the refrigerant let us see what are the important questions that appeared in the university questions university examination papers one is what is meant by adiabatic demagnetization explain how adi adiabatic demagnetization principle used in producing low temperatures as i explained you this is a very very important topic even for the examinations adiabatic demagnetization then the second one is joule kelvin effect what is joule kelvin effect and explain joule kelvin effect from maxwell's thermodynamic relations so we know that we have already we have discussed in the earlier lecture about the joule kelvin effect so this is another important question in this chapter and the third one is what is regenerative cooling so air is region is cooled uh, liquefied by using this regenerative cooling so describe a method to liquefy air based on regenerative cooling so this is the third uh, question the next one is describe liquefaction of helium by capizza method so we have discussed the experiment of uh, liquefaction of helium by capizza method this is an again an important question then what is refrigeration what are the properties of a refrigerant describe the working of a vapor compression machine so this is another important question here vapor compression machine 
uh, though it appears to be a technical term, it is nothing but our domestic refrigerator. So, this is again uh, an important question. So, this is all about production of low temperatures. <laughs>